Hey, everybody out there. Thanks for joining us for this conversation uh, as we discuss the business of music, uh, film, and uh, those intersections that now, oddly enough, it's funny that we say them all together because they are, they all intersect now. And I think probably 20 years ago from now, who would have thought that tech, film, and music would be playing together so, so well and so closely. Uh, we've got an interesting conversation set up for everyone out there um, today that will feature myself, Evan Green, and Tony Brown, or Anthony Brown. Um, and so without further ado, I really want to get into um, their, their bio so you all have a little bit more context of who's sitting with you today and who's, you know, sharing some of their information and insight and perspective on this industry. And so I'll start with Evan, who is the OG in, in this entertainment space uh, amongst me and Tony. Uh, so Evan is a co-founder of 3M Marketing, a strategic marketing agency driving innovation for clients across music, sports, and entertainment. Uh, Three Emeralds, Three Emeralds data fueled approach uncovers insights and defines strategies for some of today's most high profile brands and properties. One of the marketing industry's leading voices, Evan previously served for 16 years as CMO of the Recording Academy. That that's Let's stop right there. 16 years of the Recording Academy that recognizes some of the best, the brightest stars, the best music, and not only the US, but in the world. And, and Evan was responsible for the marketing in that space. Um, he crafted the marketing strategy to, to build the Grammys into one of the world's most recognized and coveted brands. And I think um, anyone who's familiar with the music space can appreciate the prestige that goes into the Grammys, that everyone really works in the music space to receive one of those. And so Evan is responsible for building that brand, right? Um, his vision and strategy fundamentally repositioned the Grammys, exponentially increased engagement and revenue, implemented cutting edge social presence, and built best in class partnerships with some of the most impactful brands on the planet. Additionally, the Grammys world class creative established under his leadership led to consistent recognition with marketing's most iconic awards, including the Grand Clias, Kinds Lions, and a number of others. Uh, as it relates to 3 more marketing, I, I gotta tell them this. Uh, the focus is to make clients more culturally relevant, um, identify and amplify value in new and unexpected ways, sponsorship, monetization, um, return on investment. Um, right now, he's taking on a big position in AR as the me next media revolution. Um, AR in immersive environments, it opens will bring music, film, and art in previously unavailable ways while unlocking an entirely new revenue stream. Um, strategically pivoting Olympic clients from Tokyo 2021 towards Tokyo 2020, oh, excuse me, Tokyo 2020 to now Tokyo 2021, um, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, sports team and leagues looking to understand and position themselves in the current uncertain environment and an opportunity in travel and tourism um, vertical where contraction has been significant because folks are just not traveling. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is Mr. Evan Green. The legend. <laughs> the legend, yeah. Definitely got to give him his flowers. And for our next guest that, that's going to be on this virtual panel with me is, is someone I've had the privilege of knowing for close to 20 years now, um, someone that I uh, is one of my best friends in the entire world. And I've seen this brother go from uh, Florida a and where he was an undergrad to Wall Street, where he was an analyst with JP Morgan to Goldman Chase. Um, I saw him go on and get his master's in public administration from uh, Berkeley. Um, and then from there, going to be an early stage investor in the Acumen Fund, um, to now where Tony is, is a uh, CEO of one of the, what I would consider one of the most cutting edge um, startups in music, influencers, and tech, um, where he is partnering artists with influencers across the whole spectrum that can let, that they can leverage their platform, right, to promote their music. And that company is called Breaker. Uh, one interesting thing about Tony, aside from him being my best friend, is that Tony is also a kidney donor. Um, Tony's mom was was in a very tough situation, and 
um, dealing with the possibility of having to go on dialysis because her kidneys were not functioning. And Tony was a match. And without hesitation, his brother stepped up and donated the kidney to his mother, altered her life. And for those of you who don't know, um, I've had the privilege of getting very close to, you know, kidney advocacy and understanding more in the fact that most people who go on to get on dialysis, their lifespan is shortened significantly. Um, and so Tony was able to alter that for his mom and be a donor. And she's here and she's the second mom to me. Um, and right now, Tony is, is, is based in Austin, Texas. Um, and he is working to build, like I mentioned before, that startup breaker. Um, and for me, I'm doing all of the talking. Uh, my name is CJ Faison. I am a producer um, in the film and television space. I am the CEO of my own production company, Face Forward Productions. Uh, I am most notably known for uh, producing the Emmy winning series uh, Giants under the Issa Rae umbrella that was created by um, James Bland, executive produced by Jesse Smollett. And now we just recently announced a deal where we've went from an independent series that started on YouTube to a television series, now being a streaming series on the uh, platform of BT Plus. And we just announced in the trades that we will be turning it into a feature film um, in 2021. Um, I am a graduate of Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Um, arguably the greatest HBCU <laughs> in all the land. Um, and I am currently based between Los Angeles and Atlanta. Um, and I'm just happy to be here with these talented um, gentlemen who have, you know, resumes that far exceed what I've done. So uh, while I'm going to be kind of moderating us here, I'm also going to be soaking up game, if you will. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Evan Green and, and Tony Brown. Man, tell me where I send the Venmo, CJ. You know, you know uh, I'm going to add an F of zero on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so look, gents, let's, um, let's get into it, right? So when we think about... Uh, oh, man. We're breaking up. Right. The the hey, CJ, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're stuck. Current current CJ, hey. you're... Uh, your connection's coming in and out. Your connection's coming in and out, too. Uh-oh. Um, Paul, um, I mean, I muted him just to let him try to clear out. You can hear me, hear me, right, Evan? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, I mean, while he's figuring that out, why don't we... Why don't we hmm. I'm a, yeah, I, I, you know, Evan, how about this? Just like as they figure out the technical piece, how about we kick off with that first question? Just kind of like giving the, the people in the audience just like an hey. overview of like from your perspective, hey. um, the film hey. industry, hey. And the music industry and how it's evolved oh. over the past, you know, well, 40 years. I mean, I think that, that when you look at how business models have evolved using technology, I think the name of the game is distribution. Yeah. Right. Um, from music streaming uh, to the explosion of VOD and TV video streaming platforms. It, at the end of the day, it's really about reducing friction to get entertainment in front of fans quicker. Right. Deliver what people want the way they want it um, with as little latency as possible. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can't have that conversation, at least today, without acknowledging what's going on with COVID because... Yeah. COVID by, you know, by default has accelerated, um, you know, innovation and a lot yeah. of questions that were sort of open hanging questions, I think have been asked and answered with COVID, right? Yeah. I think that delivering, um, you know, questions, simple questions just in our daily lives in terms of, you know, is video conferencing effective and efficient? Well, we know the answer to that, right? And, yeah. and now, you know, can we get content to more people in a faster fashion? Absolutely. And I think it's been, you know, driven by necessity. I also think that, you know, there's been a democratization of production and creative production and discovery, yep. right? There's the, the ability for technology to enable new tools that allow for easier creation of film and video, right? So the quicker you can, you can produce them and yep. develop them at a high quality, yep. you couple that with the distribution channels now, and yep. you can produce, distribute, um, and deliver to your ultimate fans 
in a far shorter window. Yeah. I also think when you when you when you talk about entertainment, since we're talking about art, we're talking about movies, we're talking about music, you know, that's all, you know, that that's all um, kind of customer and audience based. Yeah. And I think that uh, there's been a real problem in the industry with ticket pricing and secondary markets and scalping. And so the idea that dynamic ticket pricing, you know, where, where promoters can algorithm algorithmically kind of start to price different yeah. tiers of tickets in yeah. real time yeah. um, is a, is a, you know, I think going to set the stage um, yeah. for live entertainment as we move forward. It's, it's, it's a seamless and frictionless way using technology to, to sort of, you know, monitor and gauge supply and demand and be right at that intersection. So I, yeah. I don't know how you feel about any of that, but I think those are sort of, you know, off the top of my head, those are the yeah. three things that jump out at me relative to technology evolving um, and, and, and allowing us to drive forward. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree with that. You know, obviously the bench point that I come from is from the music angle. And it's like, you go back to the 1960s. What, one, th one thing that you said that really stuck out to me was just this whole concept of distribution model changing. Um, so when you start to think about music in the 60s, it was, you know, the radio, right? It was the clubs, it was, you know, the, the Walkman, et cetera. And, and it's like, basically like these, these, these forms of distribution were so bureaucratic and so structured that the only way that you can actually really break in that era was actually through, you know, labels, right? Because labels basically had the relationships. And I would imagine it's very similar in film and production, where it's like, you know, the big production houses had the budgets to be able to film these things and bring it out to the media. They had the media relationship. So I feel like, you know, democratization has kind of been hand in hand with technology and entertainment in the sense that, you know, when you start to like fast forward towards like the Napster and the piracy era, you know, that started to really poke a hole a little bit where it's like, man, if now with the MP3 file, you can actually transfer a file so seamlessly. Um, the pirates took over. And then as they took over, they really poked a hole in the whole concept. I think that was the beginning of the shift of the business model of the labels, in, in my opinion. And then they had like a decline in revenue, decline in revenue, decline in revenue, legal battles. And then suddenly like streaming pops up and then streaming kind of like as much as they fought it in the beginning, once they embraced it as an industry, it actually actually started to increase, you know what I'm saying, the revenues again. And I think one thing that I think a big gap is still in, in, in the concept of like, look, labels have a very powerful stance and, 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 and presence in the industry. And I think independence isn't for everybody. But I think that when you start to think about new distribution models, you have to like assess the landscape and say, man, where are we finding things out, right? And like where we're finding things out a lot of times is not just traditional media outlets, it's actually like influencers, right? Um, and so that's where it kind of breaker steps in where it's like, all right, how can you kind of automate that process? So when you start to think about, you know, distribution of, of, of songs, I mean, TikTok has been like the place basically where a lot of new artists are being, being broken, but that's still something that's still held by the coveted, even in these new distribution models, because you know, you're know you directly connected to the labels. They can reach out to the manager at CAA of the big TikTok star and kind of manually have that. And so Breaker kind of exists to say like, well, what about the long tail? You know, What about that 10,000 follower, 15,000 follower Chicago footwork kid that if you paid him a hundred bucks, he would go crazy on your song and distribute it out to his 15,000, 20,000 network in Chicago. It's geographically dense it starts to substantially build your, your presence in that area. And so suddenly it's like, we see a world where, you know, like the distribution models of the future are where the long tail can actually connect with the head. And like, I think that's what we exist for. And I think you'll start to see more of that. You'd like, it's like, you know, PayPal is talking to this guy, Mario, the way that he, he thinks about it is like these verticalized payments where it's like, you know, I think you can have verticalized marketing inside of influencers. And I think film will have its own bucket. Um, music will have its own bucket. And I think that when you look up 20 years from now, there's gonna be this seamless connection between them and consumers and brands will have to get in line. Major production houses will have to get in line. The predatory nature, if, 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 it, if you consistently provide pathways for people to take alternative routes, business models have to change to adjust to that. And that doesn't mean that they'll be obsolete. 
it would just mean that as leverage goes away, creativity has to go up in terms of still adding value. So that's that's kind of like my stance on well, that. Well, and, and listen, I think that, um, you know, when you brought up Napster, I mean, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to talk about Napster because so many people talk about the, the Napster revolution and, and all of that. But yeah. I would bring it up just to say, in, in light of what you, what you just mentioned, Napster was a revolution, not just in music, but if you couple, it, it, it's sort of akin to social media in mm-hmm. that it it shifted the model and yep. shifted the influence and the power to the consumer. Yeah. Right? Because until then, it was really all about being pushed what the what the labels wanted you to have and what the labels wanted you to see. Yep. And and what it did is I think it opened people's eyes outside of the music industry. Yep. And it finally gave consumers a voice yep. that they were demanding. And it wasn't just like, you know, if I'm a brand I'm going to heavy up on music. I mean, on, on print TV outdoor to tell you what I want you to hear yeah. or to tell you what, what I want the message to be. It became from, from sort of a push strategy towards consumers yeah. to, to a pull strategy from consumers and fans yeah. to say, no, 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 I have more power than I thought. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a bigger voice than I thought. Yep. And I think the 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 brands and the properties that didn't heed that and that were slow to the party they lost. paid a big price because now yep. when you talk about social media, you know fans have never been more engaged, involved, demanding, and frankly mm-hmm. jaded yep. about you know they, they demand um, they demand to be treated in a certain way and they demand a certain things a certain thing from from people, organizations, entities that they're willing to bless with their dollars and their mm-hmm. loyalty. Yeah. So again, not to get too philosophical, but, you know, in, yeah. in light and in context of the influencer movement that you're talking about, yeah. and you couple that historically with the explosion of social media and you go back to, to moments in time like Napster. And those were like real cultural paradigm shifts. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. hundred uh, percent. So I'm so sorry you guys lost me. That is the perks of having a, a new house with a, a temporary internet line. And, and so my Wi-Fi is, is spotty, so I do apologize. So back in, I, it looks like you guys were, were talking about, you know, where where Breaker lives now, right, within the space. Yeah, we were, just, we were just talking about more so just like, you know, just how the industry has changed, like how distribution models have adjusted. And obviously, you know, some people lost because of that and some people won. Um, and then just kind of obviously Breaker picks up on on that. But that, that's where we left off, bro. OK, cool. I, I, I love to, you know, one, get a more, I guess, broader um, outlook from from you guys both on term. How do you see the industry now? Right. And in terms of um, where it's where it's headed. Um, and how do you think COVID has, you know, impacted that, right? It's certainly impacted it. Um, I have my thoughts in regards to how I think COVID has really accelerated where we were, where the industry was was going to go eventually anyway, in terms of the, the, the way that folks are able to be so remote and the way that you're able to really alleviate a lot of cost and um, have to be smarter about the risk you take. I think from a film perspective, um, it's been rumored for some time now that the, the movie industry, the theater industry, if, if you will, was starting to, to be, you know, adversely impacted as folks were opting to stay at home, right? And and sure, it, you know, has kind of forced us into that. But it, let's talk more in terms of of the music space, as is not just film, the music, the art. And how technology really plays a big part in this new um, marketplace. Yeah, definitely, definitely, I'd love to like kick off Evan and then please j- j- jump in on this one, man. But like, look, man, COVID changed the whole entire world, and like particularly music. And the reason why I say that is because you had a world where showing up places and doing live performances was the thing. Like that was like you get on tour with a big artist and you do the opening act thing for a year or two, and like, oh, who was that? Um, you know, showing up to the clubs, like just meeting people like that fundamentally got shut down. And like what what it did was it sped up what a tr- it, it really sped up a trend like to Evan's point that was already happening was that 
music in particular was starting to get marketed more and more and more online because that's what we live on our phones all day. Um, and so COVID, you know, once that shut down, you start to see the proliferation of a whole lot of things, right? You start to see these live streaming DJ sets popping up. So suddenly mm -hmm. the power of the DJ actually became more, right? Before a DJ would have, you know, a thousand people in person or 2000 at live. Now you can get 10,000 people. Now you can get 15,000. I mean, D nice at his prime, of, of, of the heat of COVID. I mean, this guy was pulling in, I think he hit a hundred thousand one time, right? Yeah, for sure. So now suddenly like these technology platforms that really never were the source of real time live engagement with talent to consumer, now all of a sudden was like the norm. We needed something. We were going crazy in our houses without having access to this stuff. And so what, what it does is like, and it's similar to what you said, CJ, around like Netflix is that consumers just start to get trained, right? And so like uh, one of my co-founders, um, you know, my company is one of the biggest independent artists probably of his generation right now. Um, you know what I'm saying? This year in particular, in terms of like new, new talent, that's really kind of hit the scene. And it's like, bro, he, he, he did a pandemic. Um, he did a, a concert to kind of reflect the current times in the pandemic. And like, he was like, man, this is actually kind of cool. Like I can bring 20,000, 30,000 people from around the world at one time. I can spend time with my family. And I think what you'll start to see is like, as those models continue to prove to be effective, you'll actually, even as the world goes back to normal, I think you'll, there will still be a cohort of talent that still capitalizes on this ability mm -hmm. to digitally connect with your fans directly. Um, you know, we, we got accepted to the um, Andreessen Horowitz um, TXO program and one of the cohort companies in there called FutureStream, right? And so FutureStream is run by this dope dude named Javier. And basically the, what he's created is like a YouTube live matched with like merchandise purchase on site. So suddenly a talent can come on, promote this link out to his whole entire, you know, his or her entire audience and, and basically in real time perform to them and sell merchandise and take tips. And Twitch is obviously starting to do a lot of this stuff as well. And I think that stays, bro. I, I don't see a world where even if there's a vaccine that's perfect in the next year or two, that that goes away. Um, and so and from that perspective, music's change. And so, you know, I think also like as artists are starting to get more and more trained now, because right now there's no other in-person event. So what happens now if you're a new independent artist? You have to spend the money on the TikTok star. You got to go put the money into the YouTube influencer. And like what they'll realize is that like, man, this is actually more creative from a dollar return perspective than going to take the on the ground ground game at South by Southwest and that scrappy, that, that, that never goes away. But I yeah. think people will start to realize that, yo, I have to spend this money to reach out to the audience. Warner Music Group and then I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut hey, up. Hey, hello, T. Let's stop right there. Cause you said, you said a lot of good stuff. I want to let Evan, Evan jump in here. I mean, you talked about how landscape has shifted from this in-person model right in music to this this more digital um presence where it's proven to be efficient and, and on so many fronts and so evan i want to give you a chance and see i don't mean to cut you off i know you have one more point but i want to give evan a chance to speak to you know how he sees it well i think i think um the, the main point that you made that i really agree with is that behavior migrates Right. Yep. And I think when you look at COVID, um, you know, it's devastated all existing models right across the board, not just in the creative space, but everywhere. Yep. And specifically in the creative space, music, film, art, entertainment. And it not only has upended all of, all of those those industries, but it's also it's also upended expectations yep. about what's possible um, about, you know, age old expectations about what we thought was going to happen, what we thought was right, what we thought was was normal. And I think as we touched on a little bit on that last topic, you know, it's forced innovation and acceleration of new ideas and models. Yeah. And one of the most difficult things to do is to shift perception and to migrate human behavior. And I think by, you know, by necessity, human expectation and human behavior and I'm not just talking about music. I'm just talking about culturally, right? Yeah. Behavior has been shifted. Behavior has been modified and migrated, right? I mean, to go off topic for a second, you know, 
eight months ago, it looked really strange to see somebody wearing a mask, right? <laughs> and now it's weird to see somebody without a mask. So this, this idea that we thought would never be possible um, has now become commonplace. And so when you talk yeah. about how, how um, the industry, the music industry has migrated even more and more quickly <clears throat> to a digital distribution model, um, I, I, I think even if we had a vaccine tomorrow, I don't think we're going back, right? I think once once doors have been opened, things change and things shift. I mean, when you whoever thought whoever thought that that someone would blend hip hop with country, right? It's like once those things happen, there's no going back to the way that they used to be. I think mm -hmm. you know there's new ways to socially engage that that have never been available before. I mean, before and 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 post COVID, right? There's more players. So it's harder to break through on a broad scale than ever before. And so once you start to create a new paradigm and a new dynamic, if, if there was a vaccine tomorrow and everybody, you know, and COVID ceased to exist in a week or a month or whatever, the way that we'd never go back to exactly the way it was, whatever, whatever moves forward is going to have some, um, some remnants of what's going on right now. And that may take a bigger yeah that may take a bigger emphasis it may take a smaller yeah. but we just know that that because of technological innovations that have been forced on by the acceleration of of everybody being at home um that's that's an evolutionary process that's just going to keep going forward we're not going backwards yeah it feels it feels very similar to when youtube first popped and you know you had filmmakers and creators a lot able to really create things and get it out to the world without needing say in the 90s not having that and not being able to not having to go to necessarily the studios or, or the larger networks or, or um music labels to to put their, their stuff out um, and so as we think about technology right and covid partnering together in this landscape you know how do how do we suggest to folks that are are looking to kind of I don't know, take advantage or be on the cutting edge of this new wave, new bubble uh, and, and consumerism. What, what advice and outlook and, and do you do you offer them? I just think, you know, listen, I don't know that I'm an expert in 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 prognosticating, but the thing that I do always try and do is 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 understand the story and figure out, you know, where we've been, where we are and where we're going. And I would just start looking, I would become a student of, of what's going on in culture. I would become mm -hmm. a student of what's going on in the industry and start to become more familiar with the language of, of how this is all evolving. So look at what people are doing, how they're engaging, where they're engaging, what's driving um, innovation, what's driving interest, what's driving shareability. And I think the more you start to think about and understand where the market's shifting, you can start to figure out a little bit more easily your place in it, as yeah. opposed to kind of yeah. saying, okay, uh, you know, as opposed to being completely sort of self-focused on your idea, I think you've got to sort of understand the environment and the ecosystem that, that, that we're in. And I think that will start to create layered opportunities um, and layered ideas to, to, to sort of figure out how to take what you have and, and, and modify it for what's really going on around you. Man, I'd love to just jump in on to piggyback on. Sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, Evan, so I'll give you an example, man. Like we were about to launch V1 of breaker. I think I told you this on our prep call, like uh, January, 2020. Right. Um, and then, you know, we had a little bit of a product shift and like, we kind of like pushed it into February and then we all know what happened March 15th, like the world stopped. And I think like to your point, like a real life example of that is like, you know, we had patents and everything. I mean, you know, Paul could tell you guys we had patents and everything for the offline version of like the clubs. And we're like, damn, we have all this technology. we got this legal IP. And then it's like you go through the stages of grief and you're like, you just start to observe and you just sit down for a second and you start to see D-Nice popping up. And you start to like see, you know, Twitch gamers starting to have like listening sessions and A&R sessions. And you're like, oh, the world's going online. And like, you just start to observe. And it's not that we changed the idea, like the idea was the same. It was just that we had an ear to the ground 
in terms of how things were changing. And I think that if you're a student or if you're a young professional or, or anybody that has any entrepreneurial inclinations, like I think now's the time to just like meditate and sit with yourself and like really just observe the world around you. You know, I feel like there was like when the pandemic hit, my friend Nate from Andreessen was like, there's gonna be two people. It's gonna be the people who kind of like use this moment to just kind of pause and reflect and just kind of like enjoy the moment. And there's the people who just like listened, observed and had a very keen sense of what was going on around them and changed their life forever. And it's really it's gonna be binary. You know, yeah, and you know, I'll tell you the the work that we're doing with clients. Um, you know, and we're we're in the marketplace all the time, and whether it's clients or other brands that are out there, um, the ones that are looking at this as an opportunity to be proactive and 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 step down on the accelerator, so yeah. that you know, when 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 you're driving and you go into a curve, right, you're supposed to accelerate right at the apex of the curve, yeah. so you come out of it yeah. more it. smoothly and more quickly and more controlled. Right. Yeah. Everyone that's right now kind of keeping their powder dry and trying to figure yeah. out what they're going to do what they're going to, to change, they're going to be a step behind. Yeah. Right? The ones that are going to really thrive and survive w- once the world starts turning again are yeah. the ones that are looking at this about and, and, and thinking, OK, the old models aren't working. Right. Just look at sponsorship. You look at yeah. sports. There's been like 20 billion dollars that have flown out of sports sponsorship for yeah. obvious reasons. There's yeah. brands that are now pulling billions of dollars off of linear network TV. Yeah. Why? Because the world is changing and those things aren't effective right now. And so yeah. there's people keeping a lot of cash on hand and looking for innovation to yeah. look for new ways to deploy it as yeah. opposed to just waiting for things to come back so that they can renew their buys. Absolutely. Some, people, some brands will do that. Some companies will do that. And, it'll, and you know, it'll be fine. Yeah. I think the ones that are going to set themselves apart yeah. who are really going to, you know, uh, take things to the next level are the ones who are really doing the hard work right now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like a, it's like an iceberg, right? I talk about this a lot. There's that little sliver of ice that you see above the surface, yeah. right? But you don't realize the things that look easy, intuitive and and obvious, you know, those are the things that took an in, you know, a huge amount of work <laughs> to build that platform underneath. And without that platform, that little thing of <laughs> it doesn't exist. It, 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 it has nothing to sit on. Yeah. Right? So yep. I, I just think that we're going to see, just like you said, Tony, you know, two types of people or two types of organizations, the yeah. ones that are, that are, are really buckling down right now and trying to figure out how to, how to hit the accelerator once they hit the curve. Mm-hmm. And the, on the flip side, the people that are sitting back, not knowing what to do saying, well, We'll figure it out once things once things shift. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna take a pause right now, and yeah. once things start to come back to normal, then we'll get back into it. I think it's yeah. gonna, I think yeah. it's gonna be dramatic. And it makes it's it is. Show. Sorry, go ahead, CJ. No, I was gonna say it, it's certainly gonna be dramatic, and I think you know, Evan, you, you've had you both have had to pivot, right? If you will, you know, Tony, I know you guys had a model that was based off of in person events, right? Um, and, you know, honestly, you guys leverage technology in a very efficient way. Evan, you you were, were one of your clients, right? Tokyo 2020. Uh, that didn't happen. Right. And so now it's pivoting to Tokyo 2021. So, you know, how, how does that look when you talk about and you, you can dive into it as well about sponsorship, because there's a lot of preparation and investment that goes into getting a city prepared for the to host the Olympic Games. Um, and so I can imagine, you know, you know, for a lot of people, it's just the thought, well, oh, you know, it's it's just another year. It's delayed. But there is a ripple effect, right, that occurs. And I know personally from from knowing Alice and Felix and a lot of Olympic stars that it's like, fuck. This shut my whole life down. Go ahead. And I think, look, to to, to pivot effectively the core to our business and the core to my whole, you know, to my career has really been about understanding story, understanding yep. what the narrative is. And you got to peel that, you got to peel the top layers back to get to that story. Um, yep. I, I will say on a broad, you know, from, from a broad perspective, um, what we're finding and what we're seeing is a, an emergence at a level never before seen of, of purpose and, and, mm-hmm. you know, social responsibility. Mm. And I think if you look at, at what's going on right now um, in the branded world, in the marketing world, in the sponsorship world, there's very few 
straight calls to action to go buy a product. It's it's really layered in right now and nuanced with purpose and with, you know, sort of um, a deeper social responsibility and a deeper social cause. Um, yeah. Because because why? Because that's the state of culture right now. That's the state of people's people's mindset. Yep. And I think when you talk about pivoting in this particular moment in time, and we don't have to get too deep into it, but we all know sure. that the last many, many months, <laughs> um, even prior to COVID, but the world was a pretty uncertain place. Um, and, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of optimism out there. And so when you look at the sort of a general malaise that's, that's, that's permeated, the idea of doing something that that's responsible and it feels like you care um, and it feels like um, you're part of the community as opposed to just trying to sell to the community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's ever been more prevalent and ever been more important than right now. Yeah, that's a fact. I hope it's here to stay um, because it, it's something refreshing and being able to, like you said, right, it was it shifted from the push to the pull from, because what do you want as, as consumers and brands are really listening? I'm just going to tell you, I, I cut you off earlier. I know you had a point. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I mean, I just, I just want to make, you know what I'm saying? We got a, we got a crowd of people here. And I think that, you know, the biggest thing that like, if I had to summarize everything that was just said and like really like put a ribbon on it is like, man, like, you know, if big incumbents are, are struggling right now, that's your opportunity. Like if, if Bezos whole thing is like your margins, my opportunity, and that's his investment thesis to like go win the market. It's like, what's your personal thesis? And like, I feel like a, a good place to look is, you know, what are the industries and businesses that you care about? And 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 who's actually, you can pick up a 10K and, and read. Like I, I saw Live Nation's 10K and their revenue, I think was down like 98% or something insane. It's like, all right, well, how do you, how do you, how do you like, it's difficult for a business in that type of financial environment to put the foot on the gas around that corner. That's your opportunity, right? If that's like if, if, if events or live stream or whatever is your thing. And then if you just go industry by industry and vertical by vertical, you start to say like, could you just, like I used to do an early stage investment, right? And so it's like, every time you make an investment, you have to look at things in that type of framework of like where, like what idiosyncratic things are happening in the market that are causing opportunity to push. So if you view, if you think about yourself and you sit in that for a little bit and you look at the things you care about and the industries you interact with, if you just pause and look, I'm telling you, man, this is a unique opportunity that is actually once in a generation and to put a bow on that, like if you go back to like 2008, and you start to think about all the companies that emerged from the 2008 crisis, Uber, Lyft, you know what I'm saying, Airbnb, Pinterest, there was like a whole wave of companies that came out of the abyss of this financial crisis. And it's like, that's our time now. So there are people who look back and like, man, it's so obvious that you should have connected you know, consumers with CADs. Like I would have done that if I would have been like a 25 year old connected or smart. Like we always say like, I would have, I would have, I would have. Now is the moment. Now is literally your moment to like well, stand in this disruption. I, I, I agree. And, and, you know, the question is, right, when you start to audit the market and be a student of what's going on in, in, in the world and in the marketing culture, right, you ask yourself questions like, are movie theaters going to still exist in the same way, right? Which, and as a human being, it kind of hurts my heart. Yeah, like I can't, you know, I'm, I may not have the same kind of movie going experience because yeah. it's always been, you know, part of the American experience, but you know, again, and you, you brought it up earlier, um, live music. Yeah. Right? Live is critical to music. What are, what are concerts going to look like? I mean, there's people saying that, that live music isn't coming back till 2022. Yeah. There's some, there's some acts that are starting to, to plan tours for Q3. Yeah. But what are those going to look like without a widely distributed vaccine? Are people going to yep. be wearing, you know, Mask. face shields and, Right. Yeah. And, and, and Coachella <laughs> music is about the community and is about yeah. the connection. The the touching the other, right. So what are those, what's going to happen? What are those experiences going to be? And what are the technologies that are going to bring us all together? Right. I mean, there's universal human truth. And that human truth is that as human beings, we're really looking for two things, right? We want discovery and we want community. 
right? And that's th that sort of tells the story of the rise of social media, right? Yeah. If, if, if I can discover something interesting, I share it and that, get, that makes me a more engaged part of a social community. Of course. So how does discovery and community drive the evolution of culture moving yeah. forward, especially in this unprecedented moment of, you know, COVID doing yeah. things that we never thought were yeah. ever going to happen in, in society? Crazy, man. man. Those are those are some some really spot on points. There's there's certainly an opportunity here in this unique landscape that we're sitting in for anyone who doesn't know what a 10k is <clears throat> because that's very much so financial term 10k at the end of each quarter end of each year a company releases their uh, financial position and in a document that shows their cash flow their balance sheet etc and, and they're for, for publicly traded companies they're made available and so you can really um learn a lot about a company's health and a company's direction and things they may be doing uh, and so, you know, I want to take some time to to really jump into um, some of the questions from from the audience. And so, one of the first one is, uh, what is the thing that you, you most get excited about in this new panorama? Mm, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, to, it's back to I hate to circle back to what we said, but like to me, when there's, I mean, like it, in investing, we'd say like. Man, when there are crazy days in the S and P or or the Dow or you know in, in currency markets, et cetera, we love that because volatility is where you make your money. You know, what I'm saying there's so much dislocations in prices that that's where you go in. And I think from an innovation perspective, from an innovator's seat, like you have to almost view these current times and this current paranoia as the same way, right? Um, as a, as a consumer, uh, what excites me just to make it a little bit more fun. Um, man, like, I mean, CJ, you know this about me, man. Like, I'm, I'm actually, I'm like an extroverted, I'm an extroverted introvert where it's like, I actually do enjoy just being at home and kind of kicking it with, with myself and my friends and everything like that. And I think that this shift is just giving me the ability to build deeper personal relationships with myself, first of all, but also with my family and friends. So I'm like, I love this kind of shift towards home-based entertainment, um, being the thing, um, so I don't know. I, I think those are the two things. It's like, you know, how do you, how are you going to take advantage of the disruption? Yeah, that's that's super exciting to me. There's blood in the streets there for that. And then just from a personal perspective, like not doing all the meetings, the trips, like, man, who enjoyed sitting in L.A. traffic? I mean, like, I know I didn't. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, so just not I, I think the fact that 34, or 40 percent of this country has proven that productivity can remain just as high in this new paranormal. Not higher. Right? Not yeah. higher. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, I think that is going to be very, you would be hard pressed for HR representatives, even if there was a vaccine to push your top talent to come back to the office if they can do it at home. And actually the companies that try to do that old way, I think are, are going to create another dislocation in the, in the, in the work market where extreme oh. talent is going to just start to like go to the companies that say like, Hey, you can work remote permanently. So that that's going to be a competitive advantage for the companies for absolutely, sure. Absolutely. Cause like, even like right now, like, you know, we have seven employees, you know what I'm saying? With our co-founders and everything like that. And it's like, I don't ever plan on creating an office. And like, it actually helps me from a competitive perspective because now I can recruit, uh, uh, you know, an artist, you know, slash co-founder in Houston. I can have my marketing guy in Chicago. I can have my, my street team guy in Chicago. I have my, my brothers in Atlanta and, we don't have to go take on the SGNA yes. of, 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 you know what I mean? Having an expensive office. That was like a real like cost to startups having to check that box of having like, you know what I'm saying? Employees, I can put that to marketing now. So all of these things just excite me, man. Yeah. It's a, it's a more accessible talent pool. Now you can play on a global scale, if you will, if you can learn to evolve with the, the time differences and things. What about you, Evan? What, what excites you? Well, I, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, the idea of not knowing what's coming and to see the innovation and, and the idea that, you know, we could, you know, we're going to need to to give this a minute to see how it cycles through society and culture. And so a few years from now to look back and see what the impact and the footprint of all this was, I find super intriguing and exciting. But I'll tell you, the thing that I'm most curious about is how some of the industries that have been massively disrupted and actually devastated are going to come out of this. You know, 
country, industries like, you know, I have some friends in the commercial real estate business. Right? Tony was even talking about the fact that he may never go back to another office. Well, you have a tremendous amount of office space that from, you know, for all intents and purposes is going to sit vacant until the owners that have spent a huge investment on that physical space figure out how to repurpose it, right? I don't know as we sit here today, if it's ever going to be repurposed as office space. So what happens to all of that built real estate? What happens to the travel industry when, you know, the idea of, you know, me going to LAX and flying to New York for a single meeting, you know, and, and, and incurring the cost of travel and, and ground transportation and meals hotels, and hotels yeah. is, you know, that question has been asked and answered. You don't really need to do that as much anymore. So, you have an industry that was the infrastructure of that in industry, the, the, the sort of core driving force of that industry was business travel. Um, and now that's changed forever. So what happens to, you know, a fundamental core business of our economy yeah. when the, you know, one of the foundational business drivers, you know, no longer exists. So for me, as a marketer and as a, you know, as somebody who's been sort of a student of business for a couple of decades, that kind of stuff to me, those unanswered questions, I'm fascinated by. Evan, think about this though, right? Let's like go deeper on that. So there was a whole economy that was built off of getting to and from work, period. <laughs> like not even air travel, like just getting to and from work, the bodega, the egg and cheese sandwich, the, the train systems, how do you like what happens to municipalities now that like if this whole kind of like 30, 40 percent of the country is never going back to public? What does that look like? Um, it was funny, man. Another downstream effect that I didn't even think of. Like so there was like, you know, I'm looking for an admin for the company and I'm interviewing, you know, people. And this person was basically like, I'm like, yo, wait, you have a full time job at X, Y, Z. Like, how are you trying to take on a part time role or a full time role? Then she was like, well. Think about it, like expenses and travel and booking travel was like 40 to 50 percent of my job. And, you know, now I find myself at home in three hours. I can do scheduling. I'm not going on to the actual meetings. So I'm like, well, shit, I'll take another you know, job. And basically that would be my fault. So admins are almost like doubling their income now by splitting themselves out. Like so this is like all these weird like things that you never would have thought of um, a year ago are happening. So, but it's cyclical, right? I mean, yeah. it, everything is cyclical. So, um, I mean, obviously this is a forced cycle, but yeah. you wonder five years from now when everybody's working at home. Yeah. You know, look, I got I got a wife and two teenage daughters, right? There's there's times that I wish I had an office to go to. Facts. Uh, so, so <laughs> the question is, after doing after after implementing this model for um you know for for the next couple of years are you is there going to be another shift where people say you know what i need to get out more i need yep. to connect with people more i need to you know i need to be in a different kind of co-working space yep. right so nothing yes. i don't think you can count on anything staying the same for a prolonged period of time especially with the rapid speed of change that we have now um so yeah i i agree with all of that but then if you project a few years down the road, you know, what is what is the idea and the need for human connection do to to that whole paradigm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Evan, I, I think you sorry, I think I think you hit it on the head. I think both of you did some very interesting points. But I think what we see is an emergence and this what what a while ago was called Workspace 2020, ironically. But it was this concept of shared working spaces and no particularly dedicated, right, office space to one individual. It's it's this space that's almost like a commuter office space where you can go plug in, you know, your laptop, do your work, have that human interaction. Maybe if in the case that you want to sit in a boardroom and still get that because, you know, being based between LA and Atlanta here, I'm, I'm looking now to like, hey, I really want to get into a, um, a workspace where I'm not always in my home with my wife and my dog. Um, I want to get more into it because it just it's just a different, you know, your your environment really dictates sometimes your energy and, and what you can get um, done. Um, so that that's very interesting. I'm super excited as a consumer 
uh, to see where the industry shifts. I know as a uh, filmmaker and as a producer, you know, one thing that I'm paying attention to is the, the amount of returns and what you can see on projects, right, in terms of films with the movie theater not being as, as large as it once was, right? And then that obviously has a trickle-down effect in terms of the risk and that studios are willing to take in terms of the size of their budgets and different things. And so that's pushed us as a production company to be more creative in terms of the type of content that we create, right? How we can shoot that content and, and lean more heavily into the unscripted side of things because um, they're, one, people want to feel good. And people want to see and share experiences that other folks are having right now. And two, uh, traditionally unscripted is a lot cheaper than say a narrative and so there's more of an appetite for that type of, of risk um, right now and, um, that we got. Um, and so examples that you all can think of, of new artists that are, are riding this new wave of technology and culture um, shift that, that you think and feel are, are really great case studies. Tony, I see you smiling, and so you're ready to, hey, get ready. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, we don't ride the wave, we create them. Toby Wigwe is hands down the GOAT of 2020. I mean, this guy, oh man, like first of all, for the past four or five years, we all have like been slowly following his rise. The YouTube streams are going up, fiercely independent, deeply cultural, deeply authentic, and then Breonna Taylor dies, right? And so he had this groundswell of people who were already supporting his movement. And then he came out with this like arrest, the killers of Breonna Taylor. All y'all who think we need more evidence, you goofy. And like, we went crazy. And like suddenly this guy who had been using all of these social media channels had Erica Badu, Jay-Z, Ho, I meant Jay-Z, Ho, Ho, Beyonce, um, all these people were like so Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart pouring into him to get him to where he was. And then this cultural moment hit. It's like, it goes back to like the book Outliers where it's like, you know, like ground swells happen and then the right place at the right time hits, like that moment in time hits and then suddenly it looks like you just popped out of nowhere, but Toby had already been building up until that moment in time. And I think when he put that song out, it put the world on notice that like, yo, I'm for you guys. He calls us his cousins, right? Like I'm for y'all, like I'm here for you. My art is for you. Then you go look at the catalog re retroactively. You're like, yo, he's always been about that. And then the pandemic project hits, um, you know what I'm saying? Try Jesus, don't try me hits. And it's like what he was doing, like, this guy was actually speaking to our core identity and he was speaking to our pain and he was using technology to put it out. And so I think he is a textbook case study of, of, of right place, right time, being true to self, paying off over time. And I cannot wait to see what comes of it now that the whole world knows who, who he is. And I, I think he just played this thing. It's not even play, he was just himself. And that's what makes it so dope. And then, you know, he has the business partner, Jeff, who is a beast. Um, and, and just helps him kind of organize and, and execute against it. And like you got Nell, Fit Fat, like that whole thing that they have going is a real thing. And I think it's actually gonna be a model for the future um, of just like this fiercely deep connectivity to culture and authenticity and leveraging social media to be your own independent platform. I think Toby's the GOAT this year. For sure, what do you think, Evan? So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the flip side of that, right? All right. Tony, Tony talked about, you know, somebody that emerged through culture and bubbled up. I'm going to talk about what Travis Scott did, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, just a bullseye in the center of what's going on in culture, right? What he did with that live, that live concert in Fortnite became cultural conversation that yep. became yep. Uh, that became a, a moment because yep. it represented the intersection of music and gaming in a way that we hadn't seen before, right? It was, it sort of broke it wide open. And so here you have, here you have an artist who's got, you know, a, a highly credible following. He's at a, at a, at a really high level um, from a, from a creative standpoint, from an artistic standpoint, from a popularity standpoint. Absolutely. And then the idea of merging with, you know, one of, if not the most popular, uh, you know, games on the planet 
in a way that felt authentic and didn't feel opportunistic. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, and it just was incredible. Okay. That was I hard. I just think that that was, that, was a, that was a moment in time that I think we're going to look back on. Uh, and then from there, obviously, things just cracked open even wider for him. Yeah. You know, and then became, you know, the, what, what happened with McDonald's and we all know it. But, but that, that moment where that sort of intersect, that, that flash of intersection, um, it was, I, I think it was something that, uh, it was in change. You know, that, that's hard special. to overlook. It was special. Yeah, for sure. Um, I agree with both of you. Um, and so look, we, we are, you know, kind of approaching the top of the hour. And so I, I would be remiss if I didn't allow you all the platform. To, to really share with, with the audience that we have here today. You know, I gave the bios, I'll let you guys give the outro. <laughs> um, and Jules, if you wanna leave everyone with. Yeah, I think I think Evan, man, um, since yours is gonna be so powerful, I'm gonna go first. <laughs> um, so now, nah, man, I mean, look, you know, guys, I'm, I'm starting a startup. Uh, we've raised, you know, several hundred thousand dollars of pre-seed capital. Um, you know, backed by Andreessen and Horowitz. And I truly believe that we're sitting on an idea that's for the culture, by the culture. Um, so, you know, I'll pop the website in here, www.musicbreaker.com. Check us out, man. If you know a &Rs, if you know influencers, if you know artists who are looking to get broken, definitely check out the website. And I'll say this, man, it's like, you know, if distribution models are changing, and, and all of this digital real estate is something that, you know, is, has not really been fully aggregated, particularly on the micro influencer side. Like, let's build that together because effectively that becomes a culture tax. Because let's just be very clear. These big companies have been riding the trends of black and brown culture for a very long time. OK, very long. If you look at the 10 Ks, even of like these major labels today, they will tell you they're going into the clubs to see what's going on, to see what the new trends are. The, the fashion houses will say in their investor reports, like we go to the inner cities and we try to see what's going on. But like for the longest, man, we never actually capitalized on that. We never actually were able to put a tax on that. So now what we're doing at Breaker is really it's like we're empowering creators to say, no mas, here's the price. We're not negotiating this price. And you see the data in terms of what I drive in my own micro bubble. And we want to create an army of influencers and by the way, when I say culture, it's not just black and brown, but like, let's just be clear, we drive a lot of that, but there's also white, Asian, like Spanish, like there's people, like when I say culture, it's, it's a progressive, cool ass way of thinking that needs to be aggregated because I feel like once we aggregate that, then man, like we can go work with people like Evan to go engage major brands. We can go work with these monster corporations that can start to programmatically kind of like engage with them in a fair way. No, don't just like let them create these trends and these dances and these opportunities and then let them see nothing from it. And so Breaker views that intersection of culture, brands, music, technology as like this like centerpiece of where we live. And like, we can't do this shit without you guys. You know what I'm saying? And so if you guys can like support us, repost us, tap in the, with the creators, man, like, man, I'll just, that's my outro. And I think for the personal word of advice is like, if there's anything I learned about myself during this pandemic is that, man, sky's the fucking limit. You understand what I'm saying? And, and there's literally nothing that you can't do and bring into the world if you have the will to fucking put your head down and do it. And like, it doesn't matter yep. where you're from and like, let's get it. So yeah. That's my Wise words from an even more decent man, Evan Green. Where you at? Uh, well, uh, well, that's that's tough to follow. Tough <laughs> to follow. Um, I, I will say that uh, you know the speed of change is 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 rapid, and also is the speed of obsolescence. Right? Unless mm -hmm. you're unless you're driving forward, you'll get left behind. Um, you know, at 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 Three Emerald, the reason that that my partner and I started Three Emerald is we had a lot of years experience on the marketing, the branding, the sponsorship side. And we saw it from both sides, from the property side and from the brand side. And we saw a really big opportunity in some white space at that cultural point of intersection where music, sports and entertainment meet, because those are the three pillars that are driving cultural conversation right now. And I say culture a lot and I say conversation a lot because that's really what it's about. If you can find your way into that sort of that, that stream of dialogue, um, that's 
that's how you become relevant. And I think that when you, when you, what we do for clients is we help people get to a deeper and a better story, how to connect with fans, how to, te- how to connect with friends, fans, followers to drive a greater ROI from a property side. It's how do we generate more money from a brand side? It's how to create deeper, deeper connections that ultimately leads to more transactions and ultimately leads to greater revenue. So at the end of the day, it's about revenue. But I also think technology can't be overlooked. The next wave of media and the next wave of, of technological innovation, innovation is going to be AR. AR is, there's a, there's a promise that's been made by, by the AR industry that has, you know, that's all about opening up new avenues of monetization and engagement. And I think, I think we're finally there. I think what you're going to see from the AR space, and we're getting very involved in this with, with clients, I think what you're going to see in the AR space is that there is going to be massive, not only massive innovation, but massive adoption. And it's going to Uh change how we interact in every facet of entertainment and almost every asset uh, aspect of, of daily life and interaction. Yep. Yep. Man, Uh, man. No, I think I think both of you are, are spot on, and I think you both have shared some some really good gems today. I hope that our audience um, at home um, are in the shared workspace watching us today. Um, felt fed by this conversation. I certainly did, and um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all for having us. Yeah, I appreciate it. Be well. I'm gonna be in contact with you, brother. All right, you too. <laughs> all right, man. All right, all right guys, be good.